Now, contradictory statements from the Israeli leadership on the Iranian nuclear issue have showcased how tension around the issue has soared. Next, here on RT, we discuss the situation with retired U.S. Colonel Douglas McGregor. We're sitting down with Douglas McGregor, a retired Army colonel who fought in the Gulf War and was referred to by some officials as the best fighter the U.S. Army has got. Mr. McGregor, thank you very much for joining me. Good to be here. President Obama has put forward an ultimatum for Iran, either make progress with negotiators or face consequences. Consequences meaning war. Some say a strike may happen within the next few months. In your opinion, how realistic is that? Should we expect a war in summer? Topical question right now in Washington, D.C. I, I think the answer right at the moment is no. President Obama is not remotely interested in waging war against Iran. So let's be clear about that. No one at the top of the United States uh, military establishment is interested in waging war against Iran. And the intelligence community has made it abundantly clear that Iran is nowhere near the development of a nuclear warhead or the capacity to deliver one. So when you add those things up, it's, it's very, very obvious that at least in the places that count, the White House, the Department of Defense, there is no interest in waging a war on Iran. On let me, let me say something. That, that's a great, there's a great push from Israeli influence groups for President Obama to yes. back a potential strike. And as you said, the administration says the Iranians haven't even decided to build a bomb. Mm. So all this war talk is based on what? It's based really on, uh, I think, the American-Israeli Public Affairs Committee and its uh, subordinate elements or affiliated elements that represent enormous quantities of money that over many years have cultivated uh, enormous influence and power in Congress. And you so simply, the war talk is just to appease the lobbyists? Well, I think you've got a lot of people on the Hill uh, who fall into two categories. One category that is interested in money and wants to be reelected, and they don't want to run the risk of uh, the various lobbies that are, that are pushing uh, military action against Iran uh, to contribute money to their opponents. Colonel McGregor, some say the Israeli leadership sees this summer as that window of opportunity that they don't want to miss for two reasons. One, Iran has very few friends in the region. Syria, its closest ally, is, is a mess right now. And second, presidential elections coming up in the U.S. Some say Israel is going to use their leverage over President Obama, and it's going to be very hard for him to say no. What do you think about that window of opportunity for Israel? Well, if you were to launch a strike in the summer, this would cause a dramatic downturn in the economy. Just consider that we had a rumor that supposedly Iranian commandos had destroyed a pipeline in Saudi Arabia. Utter fanciful nonsense. And eventually, it was denied by Aramco, the Saudi Arabian oil corporation. But in that short period of time, oil skyrocketed on the market, up beyond $115 a barrel. But the point is, just the rumor of action was enough to send oil through the roof. So we had a foretaste there of the dramatic economic consequences for the world if we move ahead and support Israel and its desire to strike Iran. That's why I don't think President Obama is remotely interested. So they, you don't think that the Israeli leadership sees this summer as a window of opportunity? Well, they, they may, but look, don't count out the Israeli population. Let's not assume that everyone in Israel is anxious to see Iran destroyed. I think that's misleading. There, there's more division of opinion in Israel than we think. So again, how long can Mr. Netanyahu and Mr. Barak play this game of essentially trying to bully President Obama and push him into an action that he would otherwise choose not to take? The administration is basically saying all they need is evidence that Iran has acquired a nuclear weapons capability. And here's what I want to ask you about this capability issue, because it's very vague. Yes. I mean, it means being capable of doing something, but not necessarily doing it. Yes. How do you see it? Well, it's deliberately vague. It's deliberately ambiguous, so that various people can define it as they like. What is a capability to do something uh, in terms of weapons, nuclear weapons development? Well, how much enriched uranium are we talking about? Is it just enriching uranium? Does it involve uh, packaging the enriched uranium? Does it involve a test of some type? 
No one has been very specific, and I think that's purposeful because you could, if you're sitting in the White House right now and you're sitting at the CIA, at NSA, DIA, or in the Pentagon, you can always say, well, we said capability. We don't see it yet. So is the purpose of that to, to keep the Israelis in this uh, in vagueness? Well, uh, President Obama's preeminent concern is to get reelected. And that's a very dangerous proposition right now for him, depending upon what the Israelis do. If they launch a strike, let us say, on their own, without consulting us, independent of us entirely, and they do it, say, late October, shortly before the election, Obama then can say, well, you know, we're obligated, we have to help our Israeli friends, and he looks good. If they do it earlier, then the consequences could be very profound for him because it would certainly tank our economy. We would be in severe difficulty here in the United States. Election, we have a very neo-Wilsonian interventionist elite inside Washington that operates independently of the American people, that thinks of itself as being morally superior and justified in taking action anywhere against anyone that it deems appropriate. That's the problem. And the Iranians are justifiably concerned about that. But they have not reached the point where they can weaponize anything. They don't have that capability, and we do have the ability to detect that, know it, and respond to it. They know those things. What we need to do is move beyond this ridiculous confrontational setting that both of us are trapped in. And that's very hard to do in an election year when everyone is pandering to various elements of the electorate for money and votes. Colonel, let's say world powers, P5 plus one, mm -hmm. negotiate something, but the results don't satisfy Israel and the U.S. And they do go to war in summer, as some predict. What kind of immediate backlash should they expect? Iran's trump card is subversion the ability to subvert. So the retaliation would be in the form of terrorism? It would be in the form of uh, what I would call asymmetric attacks. In other words, uh, high payoff, low investment. In other words, use what you can uh, beyond your borders in populations friendly to you to attack the other person's interests. Now, we shouldn't underestimate how much damage that could involve. And remember, we know that, for instance, Hezbollah as well as other uh, as Iranian elements are here in the United States. So we know that we would sustain losses here at home. There would be damage here in the United States. How many bombs would you have to explode in, in public malls to do enough damage to awaken everybody to what's going on? Um, my point is, we, you know, those are the kinds of things that I would expect, but a direct military confrontation would be a losing proposition for them. They might be able to inflict damage on our air forces and our naval forces, but not on the scale that would make any difference to the outcome. They, they would sustain enormous damage and enormous losses. What about long-term effects? Some say even if Iranians haven't decided to build a bomb, they sure will if attacked. Well, I would say there's something more important. Uh, we, we talk about what they will do if they are attacked. I think we should look at the rest of the world. What will the rest of the world do if Israel attacks Iran? Remember, this is an unprovoked assault. I mean, the Israelis can claim otherwise and insist otherwise and paint this uh, picture of enormous danger represented to Israel. But the truth is no one buys that. My view has always been that if you do this, if Israel does this, that Iran will very definitely have nuclear weapons. They won't have to build them. They'll get them. People will provide those to them. They will have more help than they know what to do with. And Iran will grow more hostile and more bitter and more angry and more dangerous than it has ever been. I want to ask you about Syria. The Obama administration has kind of ruled out a military intervention, saying it's too complicated. What, in your opinion, uh, keeps the U.S. from attacking Syria? There are several things. First of all, there is a quiet recognition behind closed doors that if Assad is removed, however much people do not like Hafez al-Assad, that the government that succeeds him will be a radical Islamist Sunni Muslim government, hostile to Israel, hostile to the West, hostile to Shia Islam. In other words, uh, not a good development from the standpoint of the United States or Europe. So I think that's understood. Uh, secondly, uh, there's an understanding that uh, Syria actually has, despite the fact it's much smaller than Iran, what, 22, 23 million people, I think, uh, very good armed forces. 
It does have an integrated air defense structure that would take some time to dismantle, but its ground force is actually very good. And uh, it's of the Arab forces, I would describe the Syrians as probably being among the best, if not the best, best disciplined, best officered. What would be the main argument that you would suggest for the U.S. not to attack Iran? Right now, we see Iran through one lens in one way. We see this as an unchanging uh, theocracy that is virulently anti-American, anti-Western, incurable, if you will. In other words, it's fatally stricken with this theocratic disease of religious fanaticism. I don't. I think it will change. And I think if we can back away from this, Iran will evolve differently over the next 10 years. And we don't have to have this hostile relationship or confrontation. That would be your main argument? That, that's one of my arguments. Yeah, in other words, don't look that at Iran things today. That Iran is going to change for the better? Yeah, look at the future. Look at what is driving Iran. What is, what is Iran's principal interest? Internal modernization, economic development. What do its people want? Israel the focus of everyone's hatred in Iran? Absolutely not. Most Iranians could care less about it. In fact, most Iranians are not very friendly towards Arabs. So the bottom line is, why are we doing what we're doing? We're looking at things as though they will not change. My point is that Nixon had the foresight to understand China was at the beginning of a long period of change. My point is that we're going to discover in the next few years that Iran, too, is at the beginning of a long period of change. Thank you very much. Thank you.